Stepney FC and sporting Bengal legend Tariq Hussain spends his spare time doubling up as a broadcaster, journalist, travel writer and photographer. The BBC recently commissioned Tariq to record a fascinating documentary titled America's Mosques, a story of integration. Tariq travelled across America to find out what role mosques in America are playing in the modern day. His groundbreaking debut radio programme has been shortlisted for the New York Festival's World's Best Radio Programme. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet Thank you. you. How long have you had the travelling bug? I, to be honest, the travelling bug, it's interesting that you introduced me with the tagline that I'm a Step FC player because Step FC played a major part in the bug. You know, we, when we were younger, one of the um, main things that the academy back then did was to take us out to places like Denmark, Sweden and even the USA to go and play in tournaments. And it's something we've continued to do. And that definitely played a major part in, um, you know, f um, giving me that, that desire to want to go and see the world. And especially with some of those tournaments, what was really fascinating about them is because they, they tended to be global football tournaments. The world came to you. So, you know, you didn't even have to go to see them. But then once you have these conversations with Nigerians from Lagos, with um, Tanzanians, with, um, you know, even Calcuttans and that, and, and Brazilians, you, you become curious. You, you want to see where, where these places are that they come from. And I guess I've always, I've always been um, very into travel. And how did you find these experiences? I mean, these opportunities as a young East End lad mm -hmm. coming out from the East End mm -hmm. and then traveling all over the world. Mm -hmm. How did you find them? Um, you know, because, like you say, um, our background meant we didn't come from a culture of um, leisure travel. You know, holidaying wasn't something that was a part of the norm for us. You and I both know that the closest we came to travel was going back home. You know, this was, this, was, this was the only way that we would normally leave the country. If we were lucky, we might go on a school trip. If we were very, um, you know, um, very, very lucky, you might have a football team like Stepney who's able to take you away. And even that was the exception. It wasn't the rule back then. So I felt extremely privileged to be able to see the world, you know. But also the, the curiosity instilled in me from the... I've always been a big reader, um, you know, reading about the world, reading about different cultures, reading about different peoples, reading about, you know, various histories, be it Islamic, be it European. That, that's really what fired this, this kind of, um, you know, desire. I'm going to fast forward now to 2015 and 2016. Mm -hmm. So recently you were commissioned by the BBC. You did some mm -hmm. work producing for the BBC, mm -hmm. a fascinating programme. And we just mentioned in our introduction. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your travels in America. So um, the, the, the way that I ended up working on this particular documentary was that I was actually on a trail um, out in the Baltic Sea. And um, when I was out there, um, I discovered that there is a tiny little Muslim community that has been living there for almost 600 years. Um, and without going into detail about that, uh, um, what, what then happened is I discovered that some members of that community had joined the mass migration that the USA saw at the turn of the last century, and they'd gone and built a mosque. Now, it turns out the mosque that they built is now the oldest surviving mosque in all of America. And um, I, you know, my, my journalistic work ended up on the BBC News magazine, and, and through the success of that particular article, I got a lot of attention from a variety of individuals, and one of them happened to be a radio producer, and he said to me, Tariq, you, you know, you're doing some fascinating stuff with this Islamic heritage. I'd love to work with you and do, do something possibly on radio. And so we had a conversation in a, in a cafe somewhere in Soho. Five days later, he's telling me the World Service is interested in me going and doing something in America. And, and the program itself is actually split into two. So we had a two-part program. The first was to um, look at the history of um, Muslims in the USA but using the actual mosque that I just told you about, as well as one other mosque built in Iowa by Syrian Lebanese people and um, explore their communities. And then the second part was fast forwarding to the modern day and looking at the variety of um, masjids out there in the, um, in the US right now. And amazing work. I've listened to the documentary myself many times over. Um, shared it with friends you know mm -hmm. it's had a big following on social media as Indeed. well and um, you know to you it might be a surprise to most of us it wasn't but mm -hmm. you've uh, received quite a lot of recognition for this indeed um, so shortly after um, I filmed this I mean sorry so shortly after we recorded this obviously it was my debut radio documentary I'd never really worked on radio in that way I'd been interviewed on radio and whatever but never actually been a presenter on radio and so, you know, the, 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 it was obviously something that I was quite nervous about. I wasn't sure how it would be received. But as you say, it was extremely successful. 
in the in the first week, I got an email from both the head of PR at the BBC and the commissioning editor, telling me that they were blown away by um, you know how how we'd managed to produce this particular documentary. It became the podcast of the week for the BBC World Service. So in other words, it was the biggest download on the BBC World Service around the globe that particular week. And then um, my producer was so impressed with the outcome that he decided to enter it. Not not telling me, he decided to enter it into a um, film, for, I'm sorry, a radio festival awards ceremony. And um, it turns out, I found out last week, that it's been shortlisted for the finalists. And this is the New York Festival Awards? That's right. And um, what does this say about the work that you're doing? How do you feel? Well, the New York Festival's awards, um, sorry, um, radio awards, is something that, in, in all honesty, because radio isn't traditionally my medium, I wasn't aware of. But the, now that I've looked into it, you know, I, it's, it's a global media awards ceremony. I mean, sorry, global media awards. Um, they do it in a variety of um, categories. Radio is one of them. Um, these are radio experts from all over the world. All the major radio stations from across the globe take part in it. So for me to be listed as a finalist amongst all of these institutes, very well established institutes, very well established um, produced production companies, independent companies. It's, it's an absolute honor. But also, as you say, it says something about the people out there who are listening. And they're clearly interested in these positive stories about Muslims right now. Looking into the nitty gritty of the program mm -hmm. and what you've been doing out there in America, what would you say is the role played by mosques in America? There were two parts, as I said. So the first thing we realized when we went to the, uh, for, the, for the sake of clarity, I'll call one the Baltic Mosque and I'll call one the Syrian Mosque. So when we went to both the Baltic Mosque and the Syrian Mosque, what we found is the mosques, and you and I can both relate to this, they played, far more, they played an unbelievably important role in the lives of those early migrants, largely because you know, they were migrants and these mosques weren't just places where they went to worship. You know, one of the one of the quotes that um, the the women that I interviewed there said to me, you know, these mosques were like the bridge. They were like the bridge for the people that arrived. Um, all those people that would arrive from the Baltic, that would arrive from Syria and Lebanon back then, they knew that if they came and found this mosque, they would find their people. They would find somebody willing to help them. Sometimes they might even need to crash in that mosque for a couple of nights, or so somebody would take them away. Um, you know, who someone in the mosque might invite them to stay with them in their homes. They might help them get some work. There might even be somebody from their own village there. And this is something you and I can relate to because the mosques of um, our community played the same role here early on in the of UK. Fast forward to the, um, you know, if we, if we go to the second part of the documentary and we're now looking f at far more established um, communities now and the mosques have taken on a slightly different role. Um, we, we covered four mosques in particular for the second part. Um, the first, um, one, one of the ones we covered um, was a mosque that was originally established by the Nation of Islam. And it was, um, it was uh, funds were raised for it by Malcolm X, who of course is a, a very famous Muslim to, um, that many people are aware of. And the reason we looked at that masjid is because it went from a Nation Islam mosque into what we might call mainstream Islam. So there's a story of going from being quite exclusive only black people who, call, who are part of the Nation of Islam to quite inclusive people who just call themselves Muslim. It doesn't matter about color, race, or any of those things. Um, and then we looked at um, a, a, a different type of mosque completely where it was primarily converts. And um, they were, a lot of them were white converts, you know, to be quite blunt. But what was interesting about this mosque was it was, a, it was very much a part of the Sufi tradition. Mm. Um, and Sufism has taken off in a huge way in America. You know, Rumi is one of the most um, popular poets in the USA, and it was no surprise to find that they took a lot of inspiration from Rumi. Now, this particular congregation, we didn't look at it as a mosque, we looked at it more as a Sufi lodge. This particular congregation is actually led by a female, white female. So that made it quite interesting. But the other thing was, you could attend their services, you could attend their dhikr, their sessions, regardless of faith regardless of, you know, what, what your background was, what, what kind of, um, you know, um, religion or faith or beliefs you, you had. You could come in and join in. And that was a really, really fascinating example of um, how many Muslims are, are you know, um, appro um, embracing this pluralistic way of looking at their faith. Then we had the fourth one, um, sorry, the third one, which was uh, the, the, the development of a masjid by relatively young professional um, children of either first or second generation migrants. Now that was quite interesting because that's what you and I are. And so for me, that was, that was a really, really fascinating um, um, mosque to visit. It hadn't actually been built, 
but the philosophy behind it was really, really interesting. Because they came from um, a lot of the mosques that originally carried what you might call a lot of cultural baggage. Now, you and I are originally from Bangladeshi heritage. We know, we know a Bangladeshi mosque when we see one. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no denying that it is a Bangladeshi mosque. Now, what a lot of these young people were saying is, as they were embracing their American identity increasingly, they were finding that these mosques were not f fulfilling their needs in the same way. They often found them to be a little bit oppressive in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, they served fantastic purposes in other ways, but they felt a little bit judged sometimes when they went into these mosques. They felt like the mosques were often too um, culturally centric. So these guys were developing what you might call a far more American way of um, practicing Islam, or not so much practicing Islam, but a, a far more American Muslim identity. Right. And to be honest, there are examples of this going on in the UK as well. Now, the final mosque we went to, being a um, British Bangladeshi, I wanted to go and look at a Bangladeshi mosque in the US, because of course, after Tower Hamlets, it's New York that has the largest um, Bangladeshi community outside of Bangladesh. And I deliberately picked one that I knew was Bangladeshi. It has the name Shah Jalal, which is always a, always a bit of an indicator. indicator. Um, you know, he's, of, of course, the most famous Muslim saint in, in Bangladesh. Um, and, and it was very much a, um, a kind of what you might call a traditional Western Bangladeshi masjid. You know, uh, many of the um, imams and the, and the founders and the committee were first generation, or in, in the imam's case, he had been actually brought from Bangladesh to come and serve and lead the community. And again, we heard from some of the people that we interviewed the same kind of um, concerns about whether they were necessarily serving the community in the same way, but clearly for the elder community, they were serving the community exactly as they wanted it. So there was definitely a little bit of tension in that respect. And coming from the East End, British mm -hmm. Bangladesh background, how did you find swimming in such a pot of different cultures, ethnicities, faiths, outlooks? It was, it was absolutely fascinating for me, you know, because um, as you're probably aware, my work before I did this radio documentary primarily focuses on the Muslim heritage of Europe. Um, and so to go over to the other side of the pond, you know, it was, was really, really interesting because I didn't know if I was going to find something quite similar or if I was going to find something quite different. Now, America, um, from a kind of modern American cultural perspective, doesn't really have the same historical anchoring anchorage that we have here. Mm. You know, of course, we can talk about, you know, Native Americans and, and what have you. Um, so it was interesting to see a, a, a culture and a community that was essentially probably about two, three hundred years old at most, and to see how they were negotiating um, the different beliefs, the, the, the different cultural identities. But what made this trip even more interesting is it was in the midst of the Trump, um, Trump sorry, in the midst of the Trump campaign. So the backdrop to all of this, um, you know, rushing around the three different states that we went to, we were constantly hearing Donald Trump making his stake in, stake in his claim for, you know, um, to be elected as as the president of the United States of America. So that gave it a very interesting twist in that moment. And um, you could see that there was clearly division there. There was a lot of, you know, suspicion as well of what Muslims are about. But at the same time, what I found, the Muslims themselves were very proudly American. You know, it wasn't just we're Muslim and America's against us. They, they saw themselves as one in the same, you know. And I think that's, that's essentially um, because of the fact that America, the entire population is, is more or less migrants. So these are all migrants who came. They're the white, the black, the Asians, the Arabs. They're all migrants. And so from a very early stage, these people saw that the, co the one thing they had in common was that they were migrants. So it's easier for them to embrace that American identity. So even when I met a Bangladeshi, when I met a Pakistani, when I met an Arab, what I found really, really fascinating that was a contrast to the UK is over here, a lot of Muslims, they have issues with calling themselves British or English. You know, some, um, more will be willing to accept the British identity, but very few will say I'm English. Whereas over there, th 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 there's not that issue. You know, Muslims are very proudly American. And I think there's also the whole thing about the fact that America didn't have the same involvement <laughs> In the, in the colonial experience as well, whereas Britain did. And most of us are post-colonial migrants. We come from the countries that Britain once ruled, and we carry that baggage as well. As a travel writer, broadcaster, um, how important is it to have a captive audience? To have a captive audience is essential. You know, um, for me especially, there, there's a lot of travel writing out there. There's a lot of travel blogging out there. The world has got much, much smaller. Travel has become much, much cheaper. So actually there's 
absolutely millions of people blogging all the time. And a lot of the time they're saying stuff that most of us can look up quite easily or find somewhere or, or, or um, you know, stick it into the Wikipedia, stick it into Google, or there's plenty of websites that will give that information. For me, the reason I need this captive audience is because primarily my travel is concerned with exploring a Muslim heritage that I believe the modern Muslim has absolutely no idea about. But beyond that, I also believe that it's essential he or she knows this heritage to feel more anchored in the West. Because a lot of my Muslim um, heritage travel is focused to the West for a very sp specific reason. I am from the West. My children are from the West. My children are going to be living here. They're going to be staying here for, you know, for, for, for the rest of their lives and their children and so on. And this was also the interesting thing when I visited a lot of these older communities in America. For me, it was like looking into the future. These were communities that were set up at the t turn of the last century. They are four or five generations on. Okay? And they arrived the same way my father arrived. And their children are obviously um, four or five generations on. For me, it's like this is what my great-great-great-grandchildren's um, family will be like. And it was interesting to see how they'd held on to any sense of identity from a cultural perspective, how they'd held on to any sense of identity from an Islamic perspective. From a, you know, all, all of this was very, very fascinating. And one of the things that I found and, and, and I felt was quite sad, and this is what has motivated me even more, is the vast majority of them in that particular example weren't aware of their heritage. And I think it's a big problem for the Muslim community. We don't value heritage. We don't value, and, and earlier I mentioned Malcolm X, and one of the most famous, uh, most inspiring quotes that I heard as a young boy about Malcolm X was the fact that he would, he, he, he would often say, and it's understandable coming from a man who didn't know where he was from, um, he would say, you never quite know where you're going until you know where you've come from. And I think for Muslims, that's, that's a big issue. Of course, we, you know, don't get me wrong, we always try to connect with the Prophet and the companions, but then we seem to bypass all this massive wealth of Islamic heritage in the middle that has so much to teach us as well. And I think we, we neglect it at our own peril. And on that note, what should people do or what can people do to awaken this interest in their heritage mm -hmm. and history? Do you mean through travel or generally? Generally. Generally read. Read, you know, watch documentaries. You know, there, there's a lot, uh, whilst I've said to you we're ignorant of it, we also, we're also in a very wonderful position where media is extremely um, widely available, it's freely available, there's lots and lots of exciting, interesting people doing lots of things on the internet. They often tend to be in the kind of niche media um, avenues. So you often find individual bloggers like myself, individual writers that are doing these really, really interesting things about Islamic heritage. So go and explore those. You know, go, go and read these things. Go and watch these little um, documentaries. Fo follow these people on Instagram, on Twitter and everything else. Because there are a lot of people that are realizing this. But also, when you travel yourself, you know, it's, it's not going to be difficult to pick up a guidebook or just throw in something into the search engine and see if there is something worthwhile in the very area that you're traveling to. Because I tell you right now, every single corner of the planet seems to have something that is connected to our Islamic heritage in some way, shape or form. Even the Americas, as we've seen. And we're, we're, we're just talking about the recent history. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the, one, of, one of the fascinating things that I came across while I was out there is this claim that the entire South American continent is littered with Islamic heritage that needs to be explored and clarified, confirmed. Because, of course, it was Spain that went to South America. And they went there shortly after they took over from Muslims in Spain. So that cultural heritage was still in their midst. And there's lots and lots of theories about loads of Muslims that went along with Columbus and those that came later. So every single corner, the point I'm making is every single corner of this planet has some kind of Islamic heritage. And it helps us to anchor ourselves. You know, it helps us to understand who, who the great people were of the past. And inevitably they inspire us today as well. You've taken some giant leaps in a very short space of time. What does it mean to you as an individual to have been shortlisted for such a prestigious award? I think for me, it's almost like a legitimizing of what I'm doing. You know, I, I started doing what I was doing because I believed it needed to be done. I believed it was something that was being neglected. I, I felt like it was this massive, massive void in, for want of a better word, our identity or our understanding of Europe. This is where I started with Europe. I felt like, you know, Europe has this, um, this overt um, notion that the heritage in Europe is primarily Judeo-Christian. This is what you hear, okay? I began to ask myself, how can this be when there's 1400 years of Islamic history here? 
And so for me to get this award, the award is secondary, you know, it, of course it's wonderful. It will give me, you know, we live in a world where um, you have to do certain things to get recognized. You, you, you know, you, you have to um, talk to have certain networks, certain doors have to be opened. You know, the BBC door was only open because I happened to get an article on the BBC News magazine. Now, now that I've got an award, I'm hoping other doors are going to open. And really for me, it's just about acquiring, what's really important off the back of this award is that it's about acquiring those platforms that I really want. I'm, I'm desperate to put this stuff onto a platform where people are going to enjoy it and people are going to learn and people are going to be inspired to explore their own heritage. And I'm being very specific when I spoke, talk about people. I'm talking about Muslims in the West. You know, Muslims in the West, I, I want them to be inspired to go out there and, and look for their heritage because it is theirs. We might originally be from Bangladesh, but we are now people of the West. So why aren't we exploring what Muslims in the West have done? Why aren't we going and meeting these Muslims who are 600 years old, 500 years old, 200 years old, whatever they are? Well, this, this is our community now as well. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be a case of, you know, I'm going to choose the Muslims in the East over the West. Embrace it all. Embrace it all. Don't just choose the history of the East and neglect the Muslim history of the West. Embrace it all and let's, let's reorientate this idea that, you know, you, Europe is primarily Judeo-Christian. You know, I, every, everything I've looked at tells me that Europe's culture, identity, its, its notions of free market, its notions of um, liberty, freedom, freedom of speech, they were all developed with the help of Muslims. Let's take pride in this. Let's claim this. And then let's feel proud of being who we are right now as well. How many countries have you visited? Are there any particular memories, magic memories, I should add, that you would like to share? I think... Um, uh, the, the countries, I, I, I don't really count them or tick them off the way my wife does, who's very much a kind of, you know, right, I've done that many now. But they're, they're obviously bordering close to the hundred, you know, now. And um, because um, a lot of the focus has been in Europe, I've gone out of my way consciously to cover the continent. And this summer I'll be finishing that, literally ticking off the entire continent. And that's because of a specific agenda. I've also done tons of North America, parts of Asia, the Middle East and, and, and the Americas, as you've heard. Now, in terms of inspiring moments, um, a lot of people that are watching, who, who are increasingly become conscious of this will know what I mean when I say Spain was fantastic. Spain was phenomenal because it was a, 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 a moment of great awakening for me. You know, to, just before I, I turned up in Spain, and I'd actually visited Spain even before that, but I knew nothing about this stuff. Just before I turned up in Spain, I became aware of the you know, phenomenal um, Islamic history that took place down there, often written in history as the Moors, you know, for want of a better word. But of course, it's essentially Islamic history. It's a, it, in many ways, it's a continuation of the first family dynasty we see in Islamic history, the Umayyads. They turned up in Spain and they developed this phenomenal culture of... Um, you know, intellectual traditions, academic traditions, tolerance, and so on and so forth. But for me, the reason why this was such an inspiring moment is I finally realized that the shoulders, um, the, the, the shoulders of the giants, that the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, these wonderful, you know, moments in European um, history, I realized that they were standing on the shoulders of these guys. And so I legitimately felt like this was my heritage as well. I now feel like the European Renaissance, the Enlightenment, all of these things are mine as well. And to take ownership of all of these things, I think, is what helps a lot of young Muslims in the West feel a lot more, and not just young Muslims, every, every Muslim in the West, feel a lot more at home at being British, Western, European, all these identities that we struggle with at the moment. Well, I think I know the answer to this one, but um, what comes first, football or travels? Well, clearly once upon a time it was football. But nowadays it's travel and you know that from the recent trip we did yes. where although we, we were out there for football, I clearly wanted to marry it with some, you know, travel, some cultural excursions and some Islamic heritage. And uh, obviously you recently travelled with Stepney Football Indeed. Club, myself included, yep. to uh, Morocco. We, you know, we had a memorable week out there. Um, just care to enlighten us about what you did out there in a nutshell? Yes, yeah, so again, um, you know, one of the th fascinating things about w w Morocco is its proximity to Spain. So, in fact, the history that I just spoke about in Spain made its way over from Morocco. So, as, as you probably recall, I dragged you along to Kairouan University, um, which is, according to the Guinness Book of Records and the UNESCO World Heritage um, Institute, this is the oldest um, diploma awarding university, continuously diploma awarding university in the world, founded by a woman. So lots of things to be proud of. But for me, it was also seeing the continuation of those Muslims that eventually came to Spain. And you saw that in the art, the architecture, the style. It was very Andalusian, as they call it. Um, and, you know, we, we even had a direct connection where the, um, the actual minaret of the Kairouan um, madrasha, as they call it, or masjid, 
um, was something that was built by one of the sultan, uh, sorry, one of the emirates in Spain. He actually built that. So there was this wonderful exchange. And the other, the other place that we, um, the other person that we went on the hunt for was um, the phenomenal medieval Jewish scholar Maimonides known as the second Moses yes. and um, we went and found his house unfortunately we couldn't get in couldn't because get somebody in. had yeah. sold it and he's clearly going to make an absolute <laughs> mint out of it but Maimonides is, of course is interesting and I, I explained this to you on the journey as well what I love about Maimonides and, and the Jewish community of, of that era is it typified how early on Muslims really embraced the Islamic um, you know and the Quranic spirit of coexistence of tolerance of acceptance you know, the Maimonides flourished initially in Spain because there was a culture that had been created and a, and a society that had been created by Muslim Spain that allowed anybody, in, just like we have in our society today, a meritocracy. Anybody who was intelligent, anybody who worked hard enough could really rise right up to the higher echelons of, of society. And Maimonides did. You know, he became a phenomenal scholar. Later on, he goes on to become the personal physician of another great Muslim, um, Muslim um, figure in history, Salahuddin, but that's out in Egypt. Now, Maimonides' arrival in Fez is another interesting face of Muslim culture as well. A sadder one. Because the reason Maimonides left is because we had a slightly more, not slightly, a very intolerant group of Muslims make their way over to Spain and effectively dismantle this culture of, you know, um, coexistence that I spoke about earlier. So in Maimonides' story, we see the beauty and the beast of some of our, you know, Muslim heritage. And it was evident out there, wasn't it, when we mingled with the local Moroccans in the market? Indeed. How proud they are yes. of, this, uh, of this heritage there. Indeed, indeed. Which brings me to my next question um, about integration, coexistence, integration. Are Muslims integrated? I think um, that question is quite a difficult one to answer. Firstly, because the word Muslim suggests we are one kind of monolithic group of people who all behave and act in the same way. And you and I both know that's, that's not the case. We have a whole variety of Muslims. The, the mosques I visited in the USA give you that. You know, we have Muslims who are very culturally centric with the Bangladeshi mosque over here. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got a white woman convert Muslim leading a group of people of all faiths of all persuasions, including all different sexual persuasions, which Muslims at this end of the spectrum may have an issue with. So Muslims aren't the same, firstly. Okay? Are they integrated? That all depends on where they are on that spectrum. So some of them will integrate only as they see fit or necessary, whilst they will um, keep quite an exclusive, um, um, an exclusive nature about their own community and their own kind of norms, and, and some people will deliberately detach themselves from that. They will only engage with the local Muslim, I'm sorry, the wider society as much as they need to. Now, I think in, in the UK and in the West, that's decreasing at a rapid rate. And I think actually, when I go around the UK, when I travel around Europe, I find phenomenally integrated Muslims. And I'm bringing it back to Europe because I want to talk about these Baltic Muslims. So here we have Muslims who arrived in the Baltic, Lithuania, Latvia, Poland, Belarus, 600 years ago through, through a phenomenal story that can be told another time. They're completely integrated. You can't tell one from the other. You know, you, you wouldn't know them. I mean, I say you wouldn't know them. Uh, the, Tartar, um, the, the Baltic Muslims are, in fact, Tatars. You know, they, they, they come from that whole kind of Mongol race. So clearly they have a certain um, visual, uh, sorry, facial features that, will, that can make them quite distinct. Yet they had completely integrated into um, Lithuanian society. They had completely integrated into Polish and um, Belarusian society. And, of course, b when we go across the way into America. And they'd retain their proud identity as Tatars and as Muslims. And this is the challenge we face as Muslims going forward. Many of us are migrant Muslims. We're very proud of our roots. You're a very proud Bangladeshi. I'm a very pr proud Bangladeshi. And um, sometimes we feel like incidents of that. You know, along the way, other things have happened to them that have meant they've lost things. So, for example, the Baltic Tatar story, you know, in the 18th century, they lost their language. You know, and this is something that happened because of isolation from the rest of the Tatar world, but also because sometimes if you're not speaking, if it's not a living language, if you're not using it in your daily life, it's very difficult to retain that unless you go out of your way to set things up. But to go back to the question without you know, digressing too much, um, yes, Muslims are integrating, but unfortunately there are <clears throat> a small minority that don't wish to integrate, and they have their reasons for that. 
you're a celebrated journalist. People will be looking at this interview. They've read your articles before. Mm -hmm. They've listened to the documentaries. Mm -hmm. They'll be thoroughly inspired by what they've seen. Uh, there may be some on the fringes, mm -hmm. not taking up the pen or not mm -hmm. blogging. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many mediums that we have at our disposal mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. How can budding journalists, authors, travel writers take inspiration from someone like yourself mm -hmm. and work towards using their God-given skills for the common good? Indeed. Um, they, they live in a wonderful age. You know, um, one, one of the other, um, um, sorry, one of, one of my other hats that you didn't mention is that I'm a media teacher. Yes. So I teach kids all the time about um, this wonderful new media, much of which I don't even understand because it moves at such a rapid pace. So whilst I'm from, you and I, in the main, we're from the old school of journalism yes. you know we used to pick up the pen carry a notepad around maybe even learn shorthand writing to try and you know make our notes and whatever but journalism has has you know completely re been revolutionized with the internet yes. and this new technology you know you can grab a phone and do a lo on location video blog i think they call them a vlog and yes. someone's laughing right now i'm sure thinking this guy is really old because probably it's a dated term Terrible. okay um but you know you, you can set up your own youtube channel you can set up your own, um, you know, Instagram um, accounts. You can do tweets where you can use videos. You can use, um, you know, photos with sound. There, there is a wealth of ways in which you can excite and inspire other people about your travels if that's what you want to do. And it is easy. That's the key. It's not like once upon a time where you would have to, you know, um, lure the interests of major media platforms such as the BBC, the Guardian, the Telegraph, whatever. You don't have to do that to get your voice out there. You can be a guy on your own, sitting in your room with a computer, and in an instant, you can put it out there for the world to see. But how you generate that interest, of course, is the new challenge. So whilst the platforms are there now, the challenge, as I tell my students, is that just because you've put your travels up there and you've said something interesting, doesn't mean anybody cares. Mm. So you have to find a way to make them care. And that's the new challenge. To find a hook. Yes. To find a USP, as they say, a unique yes. selling point. Yes. Right. Uh, the work that you do, I mean, you've been to America, you've traveled various parts of the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You're interacting with people on a local level, mm -hmm. students at, you know, at the institute that, where you teach. Mm -hmm. How has been the response to your recent travels to America and generally about the media work that you do? The response has been overwhelmingly positive both from um, people who aren't Muslim and from people who are Muslim. And what's, I suppose what's surprised me, and I don't know why I'm surprised, to be honest, um, is the wonderful warmth reception from people who aren't Muslim, who are excited about all this stuff, you know, who are really happy to have someone out there, you know, doing their best to, to sort of put out positive Islamic stories of the past and of the present. And, and you know, the, the plaudits I'm getting from people across the globe who, who aren't Muslim is probably one of the most interesting, I'm sorry, one of the most, um, I suppose it's, it's the thing that makes me the happiest. But at the same time, on a local level, you know, every day um, it, it, when, when I bump into somebody and they might have seen a video of mine, I'm sorry, they might have heard the radio documentary, they might have read an article. It's wonderful, whether it's my social media or on a personal level, when they say to me, I had no idea, you know, I, oh, man, I can't wait to go out and see this place. You know, before I go, you, you have to tell me where to go and you have to do. And, and I'm getting people now contacting me and asking me, you know, I'm about to pop off to Spain. What would you suggest is the best place? I'm going to go over to Eastern Europe or I'm going to see this. And I think clearly, you know, I'm, I'm achieving on a, at least on a, on, a, on a local level what I set out to do, which is inspire people to go and see this stuff and, and, and connect with it. You started off as a backpacker. Indeed. Um, is that the best way to travel? I think w it is the only way to travel. And um, the reason I would say that, well, I'm, sorry, it's not the only way to travel. Of course, we can travel in various ways. But the kind of travel that I do, I think backpacking is a term that's often associated with it. But what I would call is independent travel. Um, and independent not meaning on your own necessarily. Because, of course, you know, the, the world's quite a big place and it can be a dangerous place. Independent meaning, you know, you don't stick to the trodden path all the time. Mm -hmm. You go out of your way to, to, to leave that hotel room, to leave that beach resort. I think, um, you know, people need to distinguish between travel and holiday. And I think there is a distinction. And we all need both. We need both, you know. Sometimes when, <laughs> when I go away after working all year, I do just want to sit there and do very little. Yeah, it's not very often because I, I tend to get up and want to go and explore something. And then there's travel. And, and travel is, I suppose, closer to what you're talking about when it comes to backpacking, which is what, how, how I you know, set out on all of these journeys. And that's where you go and immerse yourself. 
Mm. You go and immerse yourself in the culture, in the community, with the people. But you do it in a way where you are respectful as well. You know, you're not going there like um, and I'm going to use Bangladesh here because most of us um, have that in common. You don't go there with your Gucci glasses, your Gucci trainers and your Armani jeans and float around the slums and, and think that that's travel. That's, that's actually quite disrespectful when you think about it. You know, th these people are, are beyond poverty. This is absolute poverty. So if you are going to go to these places, if you are going to visit these things, be, be respectful. Mm. Try to see the world from their point of view. And you will notice that the best backpackers, and you and I come across them when we're on our travels, the best backpackers are the ones that try to be invisible. And they'll just sit there and watch the world go by. And if they do engage, they'll engage in a very respectful way. They'll even pick up one or two words through their guidebooks. Even if it's holding a guidebook, they're trying. They're making an effort. And it's through that kind of immersion, I think, in local culture that you can fully appreciate a country. You know, to turn up on Sharm el Sheikh, which to me isn't even Egypt, you know, but the, at the same time, it's a great place for a holiday. But I'm just saying, from a travel perspective, turn up Sharm el Sheikh, spend your whole time eating fast food and eating what you think is Egyptian food and sitting in shisha caffs and sitting on the beach. You're not coming back and telling me that you've seen Egypt, mm -hmm. even if you had an excursion to the pyramids. You haven't seen Egypt. Go and stay in, a, in an apartment in Cairo. Go, go and have, you know, um, full in, in, in downstairs and, and eat a falafel wrap and, and drink tea with, um, at night, you know, when, when all the older, older Kyrians are out and they're, and they're drinking. Try and cross a Cairo road, you know. <laughs> These are the kind of things that you need to do. And of course, it's not something you can just do. You can't just get up and do this. It does need a little bit of um, preparation. It, it needs a little bit of savviness and awareness. Otherwise, it can also be quite dangerous. So I'm not telling everybody to just grab a backpack and rush out the door. You know, you do need to be um, a little bit smart about this stuff. There's a wealth of information at your fingertips. Look up a few things. But also, and I, I'm not going to name, name any of these guidebooks because I don't want it to turn into an advertising scenario, but there are clearly phenomenal guidebooks out there. I can name one of them because I do work for them. So Lonely Planet, you know, fantastic guidebooks. They are written by people who walked every single inch okay. of that city to tell you what is in that book. So it's very real and it's very up to date because they usually revise these editions. One of those books will give you more than enough information to be safe, to find at least a taste of localized stuff and to go off the beaten track because they, they pride themselves on doing that, on providing that in their, in their guidebooks. And, and that's one of the reasons why I, I, you know, I, I'm consciously making a decision to work with them because they're one of the guidebooks that really inspired me and there's others you know their names as well that are out there pick these up you know have a flick through them and if they're not your thing read a blog watch a vlog you know so there, there are people who are doing vlogs and they'll say this is a great place don't go here don't go there i know reading isn't big with our with our youth today but you know there, there are mediums out there where you can get the information that will make it easier for you to really travel and um, i understand you have a baltic experience planned it's a Balkan one. Balkan. The Baltic one is the one I've done. So this is the Western Bal um, Balkans. So as I said to you earlier, um, because I'm, um, I'm actually writing a book on these travels as well as doing all of this. So my, um, I, I, my hope and ambition is after I've done this trip, I will be really in a position to sort of um, thrash this book out. And it's essentially all my travels across the West, exploring what it means to me to be European to be British and all these kind of identities I spoke about earlier and how these travels have helped me, you know, make sense of it. So to tick off the last six countries or so, I'm off to um, the Western Balkans, which is primarily Bosnia, Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro and Serbia. And, um, and I always travel with my family now as well, because, of course, I, I like to take my kids along to see a lot of this. They sometimes sit in on interviews when I'm interviewing Muslims. Um, my wife is sick to death of wandering around ancient cemeteries where I might find a Muslim grave. So she tends to just go and find a coffee shop now. But they're coming with me. We're going to be out there for a whole month and we're going to be traveling around the entire um, six nations that, that I've just mentioned and, and focusing, of course, um, a, a lot of it on the Islamic heritage. But with my family, they're also going to be enjoying a holiday as well so we're going to try and balance the two i'm sure it'll be amazing we want to wish you the best of luck with the thank you. upcoming awards thank you and lastly Tavik, you've got a travel blog indeed and a website as well so um anyone who's interested in um following my travels following my work and and you know listening to any of the forthcoming radio documentaries as well you can go to www uk, which is my personal website spelled t-h-a-r-i-k-h-u-s-s a-I-N, or if you want to follow specifically um, the travels concerned with Europe's Muslim heritage, I have a blog, which is www.europeanmuslimheritage.com.
www.ecc.eu. I'll see you this time next week. Stay safe until then.